Hi and welcome to the Financial Fox. Today we welcome once again Charles Hoskinson, co-founder of Ethereum, founder and CEO of Input and Output Hong Kong, and the mind behind Cardano, the next generation blockchain platform that promises to finally overcome the challenges of scalability, interoperativity, and long-term sustainability. Charles is an eclectic entrepreneur, is a cryptographer, but that is not all of that. The man is a legend, and he has traveled all around the world, getting to know new culture and new government. He has established value relationships from Asia to Americas to Europe and Africa, and he has got deeply understanding of each country's challenges. In a way, I kind of like to compare him to a philosopher because of his approach towards life and the way also he sees his work, which is kind of like a human mission. I'm really pleased to welcome Charles. Hi, Charles. How are you? Very good. How about you? I'm fine, thanks. So it's a pleasure to have you back on the show, especially at such an exciting time where you are basically on the brink of a whole new phase for Cardano with Shelley. Uh, do you maybe want to bring every, everybody up to date? And can you tell us a little bit more about Shelley Update and how it's going to impact the Cardano ecosystem? Sure. So uh, Cardano kind of has been built in phases. So there's kind of the pre-Byron phase. And what that was, uh, was a deep R&D time where we were doing lots of foundational science and engineering. And the point of that was to get a better understanding of the first principles of cryptocurrencies and blockchains. So we looked at it kind of like a DARPA project. So we said, all right, let's just see where the science takes us. And let's learn about what is a consensus protocol and what's a ledger. What is a smart contract programming language and what are some of the fundamental requirements of that uh, and so forth. And then uh, what we did in around early 2017 is we started developing a more crystallized and clear product roadmap and we broke it down into eras. And we said, okay, well, the first step is just to bring everybody on board, get liquidity, build up a large community, uh, get some leaders uh, and, and really get an understanding of what is it like to have a cryptocurrency in, in the public. And that was Byron. So that was released in September of 2017. Then after you run it for a little while, the next step is to decentralize the ecosystem and turn it over to that community that we constructed. And so that's the Shelly era. And that's what's launching uh, basically this week and, and throughout the next few months. And uh, there it goes from federated control, kind of like Ripple, to decentralized control, where we'll actually be one of the most, if not the most decentralized cryptocurrencies through a proof of stake system. Uh, and then moving beyond that, then we start adding in capabilities. So the next step is Gogan, and that's for smart contracts. Then you'd like to do all these things at a scale of millions to billions of users, and that's what or, uh, Basho is about. And then finally, it has to be self-governing. And so that's basically what Volterra is about. And uh, all throughout next year, we're going to be turning on all those features. So the first is going to be Shelly to mainnet. Then shortly thereafter, Gogan, and then we'll turn on Basho. And before the end of 2020, we'll have the first generation of Voltaire turned on. And at that point, we feel Cardano will be a true third generation cryptocurrency. So we'll be able to see the fruits of all that research we've done. Uh, basically, it's going to be scalable. It's going to be interoperable with many different systems. And it'll be sustainable because it'll have the ability to pay for its own development. And it'll also have the ability for people to decide on how to improve the system and vote on improvements and so forth. And all these names of philosophers, and uh, you know, they are really all very interesting names. How does it come there? So uh, I, uh, I love naming things after uh, poets, and I love naming things after great scientists and great engineers. And uh, every one of these uh, poets or engineers, they wrote something that, I read in my youth, uh, like uh, I was a big fan of Lord Byron. It's nice to send She Walks in Beauty to people from time to time. And uh, Percy Shelley was a great poet. He was actually a member of the Illuminati as well. And uh, yeah. his wife, Mary Shelley, wrote Frankenstein. Uh, so just a, a very interesting guy. Basho was, was kind of the soul of Japan. Uh, he was a very courageous person who woke up one time and just decided to go wander throughout medieval Japan, which was an extremely dangerous proposition. The best case scenario is, People think you're a spy. In the worst case scenario, you're going to get killed by a samurai somewhere. But not only did he survive, he actually survived to write about it and uh, really changed the literature in Japan. And uh, Voltaire is obviously the, fan, the famous French uh, poet and thinker. 
So we, we try to pay homage to uh, great people and, and we've done some wonderful visuals with that. And it kind of encourages people to understand that the social systems that we have are uh, things we've inherited from people that came before us. And uh, we have an obligation to kind of think about uh, that in our engineering. At the end of the day, you know, if Cardano is successful, Cardano will be here all throughout the 21st and 22nd century and could end up being a financial operating system for the whole world. So if we do our job correctly, this could become the world's next currency. It could become the world's next stock market. It could become the, the world's next voting system. Uh, so it's, it's very important that we look at things from a historical lens and ask ourselves, what would we like to leave behind? And what legacy would we like to live? You know, Shelley, for example, wrote a very wonderful poem called Ozymandias. And it was kind of a keen reminder to the finiteness of power. You know, you have all these great monuments in, uh, in Egypt, which are all just ruins now. But at one point, that they, they were like symbols of the power of the pharaoh. Well, similarly, you know, everything has a degree of finiteness to it. So you have to kind of plan for obsolescence. And you have to kind of plan for uh, evolution of the system or else the system just simply won't satisfy everybody's needs. So that's, uh, that's where the names come from, my, uh, my love of literature and uh, my, my weirdness, I suppose. You mentioned about uh, this uh, about community, and I know there are plans to integrate incentives uh, to encourage people to participate in the pot- protocol, get rewards. Do you want maybe to share a little bit more inside of uh, uh, what we should expect? Sure. So uh, we've we've thought a lot about w- w- what would make the system self-sustaining. You know, and the problem is there's really not a well-developed science here. So there's what we understand really well, like how do you build a consensus protocol? And that's something that exists from the distributed systems literature from the 1970s on. And there's always this this kind of lurking phrase you'll see in every paper, which is honest majority, honest majority, honest majority. Satoshi was really one of the first people, I think, ever to propose a consensus protocol where it actually paid people to run it. And uh, he kind of just guessed and said, okay, give them 50 Bitcoin every block. And, uh, and you know, is that too much? Is that too little? And then there's this halving function. And, you know, is it, is this, or why not divide it by a third? Why not divide it by a fourth? You know, there's there a lot of just like parameters that were magic. They were just picked out of a hat. And somehow it allowed the system to self-assemble. And it went from one person mining to massive mining farms like Bitfury and, and Bitmain and so forth uh, all around the world. So obviously he got the parameters right. So now we're building this proof of stake system and we're thinking, gosh, people are going to be running infrastructure. They're going to be running lightning channels and potentially the interledger protocol. And maybe they'll be running exchange infrastructure and oracles in addition to running the ledger and smart contracts. So how much should you pay for this? And so we wrote some papers. We actually retained a professor out of Oxford named Elias Kasupis. And we spent about a year thinking very carefully about Nash Equilibria you know, myopic behavior, non-myopic behavior, all, all these word salad of, of game theory terms. And what we settled on is saying, well, let's let's start with something in the, to begin with, 7 to 12% range uh, in terms of return. So if you, you have your stake and you delegate your stake or you're running a stake pool, uh, if you actually get selected and make the block, then your returns will be somewhere around 7 to 12% to start with. But then uh, there's a lot of other factors that can uh, change that. So because eventually these stake pools will actually be providing other services and those services will generate fees. Also, Cardano is designed to be a multi-asset system. So you're going to have not just ADA, but many different tokens running on it. And unlike Ethereum with the ERC standard, these multi-assets, eventually you'll be able to have, be first-class citizens with ADA. So when you, you transact, the hope is you'll be able to pay your transaction fees in the underlying token. So it's kind of the best of both worlds. It's like owning your own cryptocurrency. It's like launching your own blockchain, but you don't actually have to do that. You're nested within the Cardano ecosystem. And there could be a lot of other things, like we're kind of toying around ideas of um, rent on the blockchain. So you can, instead of permanently storing data, you temporarily store it and things like that. But the long and short is the providers who maintain that infrastructure are the ones who, who make fees for doing that. So they're basically true service providers uh, and uh, the hope is that they can do this as actually a full-time business. And if we get it right, it'll be quite competitive, and you'll have lots and lots and lots of people wanting to do that. And we've seen a lot of interest so far in stake pool operation. For example, um, on GitHub, uh, people are registering their stake pools right now for the incentivized testnet. Uh, the last time I counted, we had 136 people 
who have uh, registered stake pools. So there's already pretty good participation just to get started. And our hope is to get that over a thousand by the time the, uh, the main net launches. And then, you know, as with all economic parameters, basically you watch and you see what happens if you have high network performance, lots of competition, uh, and blocks are being made on time, then your economic parameters have been correctly set. If you have low participation, the chain quality is low, uh, you know, you have a, you know, a high variance of quality of service and not a lot of participation, uh, then obviously the parameters aren't well set. And so it's just as much of an experiment for us as it was for Satoshi back in 2009. But what's most exciting is that it's easy to change these things and it's easy to be agile. And uh, 2020 is going to be the year where we, we kind of really lock it down. And if we get it right, then the system will just kind of operate, be self-sustaining. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I think being agile is really a very important, uh, very important skill. Now, you have also uh, developed, you mentioned before cryptocurrency, and now we have, a, a, you know, other pay that's basically the new payment solution. Uh, what are your expectations on, uh, on other integration within the current uh, payment system? That's a great question. So, you know, it's it's really a, a difficult world to break into because there are very strong gatekeepers like the Samsungs and the Googles and the Apples and the Visas and the MasterCards. And a lot of POS's uh, point of sale systems are not programmable, or if they are programmable, they're very fragile. Uh, so it's difficult for a cryptocurrency to natively just get plugged into that system. Even if they do, it's usually through some sort of hack and you don't get global coverage. Uh, the second thing is that ADA itself is more of a field token for smart contracts and a control token for the ledger and a voting token for orchestration over what the ledger can do. It's not really intended to be a currency because it's not value stable. So, uh, you know, the hope is that we can get value stable tokens to come onto Cardano or make it very easy to move a value stable token like Paxos Standard or Tether into Cardano. And then people can use that for payments. Uh, but that said, we do have an obligation to build hooks for incumbent payment infrastructure. And actually, we do have an expert on our team. His name is Nick Nafak. And uh, Nick has got much, much experience working with integration with existing legacy payment systems. And we have been talking to a lot of partners. For example, uh, Cody is one, and there are others who are we're actively working in the, uh, the payment space. And they're providing bridges so that assets living within the Cardano ecosystem can be transacted at a point of sale. Uh, ideally, the user experience I'd like to have long-term would be that you as the holder of an asset on the Cardano blockchain, whether that be a security token, a commodity token, a stablecoin, or ADA itself, can just go into any place with a reasonably sophisticated POS, so uh, basically like Square or something like that, and you can just tap your phone and you pay with the asset you want, and then they get paid in the currency that they want to be paid in. And then there's some decentralized uh, financial infrastructure that lives between you and the merchant that handles the translation of your asset into their asset. So, for example, you hold ADA, you'd walk into Starbucks in Stockholm, you'd tap your phone, and then they would be paid in the local currency, and, uh, we'd, uh, and you'd be paying in ADA. And they, they, uh, they, they wouldn't know that you were doing that. And then in between, there's a decentralized exchange and market makers and all these things, and they're handling the translation of that, satisfying the counterparty and so forth. Well, so then, we'll, we'll, we'll build a lot of infrastructure out to accommodate that, but this is more of an organic thing. And unfortunately, there are a lot of gatekeepers in this world. No, I was, I was saying that basically that makes me thinking about the importance of uh, cross-communication between blockchain. Yes, yeah, interoperability is such an important thing, and it's, it's an underappreciated thing inside our world. You know, the problem is that people tend to be maximalists. So they tend to live in a, a situation where they say, hey, uh, if it's not Bitcoin, it's not good, and everything else is a scam and it's trash. And the reality is that payments are super sophisticated because assets are super sophisticated. Uh, everybody's got something worth something. And that could be airline miles, your labor, your house, uh, ride sharing your car. Uh, you know, there's so many different ways to represent wealth. And every single one of these ways, somebody somewhere in the world finds what you have probably valuable enough to trade a product or service for it. So the point of marketplaces are basically to be alchemists. They transform value from one form to another form, and they make sure that those exchanges are liquid and, and you know, very efficient and fast. And they also try to give you the best price possible, the most competitive price possible. 
So if we really do care about financial technology, if we, if we really do say cryptocurrencies and blockchain are here to kind of replace the world financial system, we have to replicate the magic and success of the, of the prior world, the prior market. Uh, you know, and, it, and when you really start thinking this way, you start realizing the power of what we're constructing. Like, for example, let's say you own a Lamborghini. It's a beautiful car. The minute you own that, you have basically rights to try to put, get yourself on a reserve list for special edition Lamborghinis. Like, like for example, when the Revaton came out. Yeah. Okay, well, the, let's say you, you have the right to buy. That doesn't necessarily mean you want to buy or you're committed to buy, but there's certainly a lot of other people that would want that because it only make maybe 20 or 30 of them. Well, in the old world, you know, you'd have to somehow find that person and negotiate it and then make some sort of bespoke deal with them. In the new world, you can just tokenize the right to buy. And if you don't want to buy, you can just sell it on a market. So you, you might be so lucky that you win the lottery and uh, you have the right to buy this $2 million car and, yeah, and just and sell that for, for $50,000 and you make free money as kind of a gift from the Lamborghini company because you were one of their customers. This is the world we're moving into. And the point of these systems is to make them as fluid as possible. So they all need to talk to each other. They all need to understand each other. And the key is to do this in a way where we preserve our decentralization. So what we don't want to have happen is we have these meta gatekeepers who basically get to control uh, who gets to do what where, and they get to control the flow of information, assets, and identity. So what we work on at IOHK and what we're trying to build into Cardano are a stack of protocols where it's very easy for us to talk to other ledgers, but you don't have to trust a gatekeeper, a, a trusted third party. And then you're able to move your assets uh, you know, fluidly from one to another system. The downside, though, is that it's a two-way relationship. So while we can write great protocols and do great things for Cardano, these protocols have to be supported by the other blockchains. For example, Bitcoin has to be upgraded if it's going to understand Ethereum and Cardano and so forth, unless you're willing to trust a third party to act as a, a trusted bridge. So it really is an industry-wide conversation, and there's some great science and theory that we can do to try to remove trustlessness and make these systems better. But at the end of the day, we, we do all need to actually work together and get along together if we're actually going to be fluid with each other. Exactly. And um, I think one of the other um, new things about Shelley um, is basically the proof of stake. And th that basically brings up a big problem, which is the unsustainable energy consumption that Bitcoin and other proof of work blockchains are creating. So uh, with this new phase for Cardano, um, how do you see, um, you know, this uh, energy issue um, how do you, how are you going to improve the problem about energy consumption? So uh, the reason why we spend so much energy running these systems is that you can kind of look at proof of work like a three-phase process. Uh, the first phase is deciding who's going to be in charge to make a block for, for that particular time period. The second phase is making the block. And then the third phase is for the network to look at the block and accept it. So to use an analogy, it's almost like a poker game where you decide someone has to be the dealer and then you select that dealer and then he shuffles the cards and deals the cards. And then when you receive the cards as a player, you have to say, well, is it a fair deal? For example, if you're dealt five aces, you'd say, hey, something's wrong here. There's only four aces in a deck. So obviously the dealer did something wrong. So the Bitcoin spends all of its energy, enormous sums of energy on the first part, the selecting who's in charge part. And that's, that's what mining is all about. So the power of proof of stake is that it does that in a synthetic way. So instead of saying, hey, it, we're going to have this meritocratic mining process and more is better and it's super competitive. So as the price goes up, people exert more energy. And there's no feedback loop to reduce energy consumption. You instead just say, OK, we're just going to give you a chance of winning proportional to the amount of stake that you have. And then uh, if you, you, you have 25%, 25% of the time, on, on average, you'll basically get the right to do something. Then you go and do it, and then the network has to say if it's successful or not. So you really have to go through those three stages. Well, if you eliminate that first stage, then you don't need any power consumption. Your power consumption is just the power of the computation to actually do the work, to actually make the block and distribute the block. And that's a race to the bottom. Computers are always getting more efficient. Computers are always getting more powerful. And you can do more with less energy. So uh, internally, we, we bat around the idea of, well, 
could we run Cardano on very low powered hardware? And we had a great member of the community named Marcus, and he actually did this on a Raspberry Pi, a, a Rock Pi. And uh, he was able to demonstrate for less than 10 watts of power, you can actually run a stake pool, uh, basically a device that could make one of those blocks. So for a thousand nodes, which would make us more than 100 times more decentralized in Bitcoin and 50 times more decentralized in EOS, you can run the entire Cardano network uh, basically with 10 kilowatts of power, which is the equivalent of a large home. A global scale financial system, which is dramatically more performant than Bitcoin, uh, you know, at, and 100 times more decentralized for just 10 kilowatts of power. So it's a really magical thing, proof of stake. And there's a lot of good science and there's a lot of really careful protocol design you have to put in to make sure the system is secure and sustainable. But uh, that's why we spent millions of dollars and wrote dozens and dozens of papers on the topic and, and went through the peer review process because we gained so much from that good protocol design. The other thing is, if you happen to know ahead of time who's in charge of the system, then those people can be put into a, a different user set than everybody else. And then you can use them as trusted actors to do all kinds of other things. Like, for example, they can be oracles, they can run MPC circuits, they can do NTP, they can do all kinds of things that you generally need for a network or for DAP development. And normally you trust a third party like Bloomberg or Reuters or the NTP servers or something like that. So it's basically like the best of both worlds where you don't have the power consumption of Bitcoin and you'll never have the competitive equilibria that requires you to do that. You have always a race to the bottom for power consumption. So your network gets more and more efficient over time. It's easy to decentralize that system through just balancing of economic parameters. And then finally, you have a special set of people that because they're special and you know they're special, you can leverage that to accelerate the network or provide additional services above and beyond consensus without having to centralize the system. So uh, it's a huge advancement and it's, it's, it's very exciting. It's why Ethereum is moving the proof of stake and it's why we have so many of the top 10 cryptocurrencies now moving in that direction. Um, and frankly, I think mining's days are numbered unless they can find a way to do something useful with that first step, selection step like useful proof work. If they can't, then mining's probably not going to be here in five to 10 years.